When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Welcome to The Black Table, an hour devoted to exploring ideas and subjects of special importance to African people and to others, fighting to build a better society. I'm your host, as always, Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. And welcome back to those who are returners and welcome to new viewers. We've been building every week and we've been at this for some time now. And as always, we are joined by a guest, at least one guest. And this week, we've got some exciting conversation to be had about the nature, the history, the arc, the future of this country called United States of America. And we have invited to the Black Table a man who has written a very important work entitled Break It Up, Secession, Division, and the Secret History of America's Imperfect Union. Uh, his name is Richard Kreitner. He is a son of Queens, one of the birthplaces of hip hop. Uh, grew up in Jersey, has cycled through Canada and many other number of other places. He is a journalist, a researcher, an author of, of some note, and he's published across the range from one of his homes, The Nation Magazine, uh, New York Times, Boston Globe, Washington Post, and so many other places, The Baffler, Slate Magazine. Uh, and as I said, Break It Up is what we're going to discuss today with our guest, Richard Kreitner. Welcome to the table, Richard. Thank you so much for having me, Greg. Really appreciate it. Great oh, introduction. <laughs> oh, no. Listen, thank you, man. This work is so important. In fact, uh, we were talking when we uh, you know, made the decision to try to invite you to see if we could fit into your schedule. And one of the things I was concerned about was that your the dance card would be full. I mean, the way you lay this thing out, man, I suppose we had a little thing called COVID-19 to intervene between when the book came out and now. But uh, this book in so many ways reads like a revelation. There's so many uh, figures, so many events that we think we know that we learned in the United States anyway. And we know folks are watching from all over the world. But here in the United States, we learn in our classrooms that you revisit and kind of turn on its head. So I, I guess the first question I think we, we probably want to ask you and want to know about is, you know, where did you get the idea for this book? Yeah. Um, thank you again for the really kind words. I really appreciate it. Um, as you mentioned, I had the idea, you know, kind of a long time ago in about um, late 2014, actually, right after the Democrats lost control of the Senate. And, it, you know, it, it kind of seemed like Barack Obama's presidency had effectually come to an end. And there wasn't that much to show for it. You know, I'm kind of a disappointed baby of 2008 when I turned 18 and voted for the first time and thought that I was voting for world historical change. You know, I, I imagined a T-shirt, you know, at about this time of, of great disillusionment in 2014, 2015. You know, I voted for world historical change and all I got was Mitt Romney's health care plan, you know. Um, and it seemed to me like the, the kind of constitutional structures of our country were the problem. You know, the undemocratic nature of the Senate partisan gerrymandering, you know, a, a Supreme Court that had been, you know, shaped by presidents who hadn't won the Electoral College. And that, that problem obviously got much, much worse. Um, so I was working at The Nation magazine at the time as the archivist, actually, and I was preparing for the, magazine 100, the magazine's 150th anniversary issue in 2015. It was founded in 1865 by abolitionists as, you know, to sort of plot a path forward for the movement um, against slavery in the age of emancipation. And um, I was I, based on that, I was reading through the archives. I was commenting on an article about the Constitution and the progressive view of the Constitution from the early 20th century. And that reading in the Constitution and the Civil War period especially kind of got me thinking about the nature of the Union. And I just had this thought, like, maybe maybe this is the problem. Maybe arguing over everything in Washington, D.C. in one place is, is the problem with our country. And maybe it's ungovernable. And maybe better if we broke it up. Um, and I wasn't really prepared to write a manifesto arguing that point. I'm, I'm still really not prepared. I'm very ambivalent, you know, go back and forth every day. Um, but what I wanted to know was what was the history of this idea? Of course, I knew about the Confederates. I knew that plenty of people with whom I, you know, stridently disagreed had had the idea of secession and, um, and disunion. But had anybody with whom I did agree had the idea? And I wanted to just go back through history to see if that was the case. Very quickly, I discovered that it was, you know, um, the abolitionists were are kind of the heroes of the book really are these these people who um 
argued that the North should secede from the Union, this is in the decades before the Civil War, to protest slavery, and not merely to protest it, to clean their conscience, as some historians have argued, but to fundamentally undermine the institution and deprive it of, of vital support, and in that way end slavery without you know, a civil war and all the bitterness and, and unresolved tensions and whatnot that that would entail. Um, so that was like a great big discovery on my part. I hadn't been taught that in school, you know, the South are the secessionists in the way that we, we all learn about it. That's right. um, and I was intrigued, you know, and so then I went back to the very beginning of U.S. history and I wanted to trace the idea um, across all lines of division, race, class, geography. And what I found was that it had always been there. It had been there from before the Union was formed in the first place. Mm. Um, and it and had continued even after the Civil War, even though people didn't recognize it. And I just, you know, a lot of writers, I think, say this, you know, I wrote the book that I wanted to read, but it didn't exist yet. Uh, um, yeah. And it seemed like the kind of history that we needed for the moment that I thought was coming in American politics where it would be revived. You know, I didn't foresee Trump or anything, but I, I, I could see that our divisions weren't going anywhere. Our political system was so ossified and, and, and incapable of rising to the occasion that I just figured this idea was going to come back and we would need to know the history in order to know what we thought of it going forward. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, with all due respect, I don't know that if you didn't foresee Trump, you certainly revealed the rhythms of this project that would make anybody predict a Trump. I mean, it almost seems inevitable. I love the way you say in the introduction, disunion, the possibility that it might all go to pieces is a hidden thread throughout our entire history. And and nobody, as the young people used to say, everybody can get it. Nobody escapes your pen, man. <laughs> I, I'm thinking in particular about, and we'll talk about this uh, later on when you get to the, the fourth movement uh, of, of the kind of four movement piece you map out when you talk about the Republic of New Africa. I know a lot of those cats and knew a lot of them, Mario Bedelli and Chokwe Lumumba. And, and so, you know, a, a, as a black person in particular, reading your book and thinking about Lerone Bennett and, and Vincent Harding, W.B. Du Bois and so many others who have written, you know, it was very refreshing to see someone approach this narrative in a way that is usually kind of reserved for academics who don't necessarily have a wide range of readership. But what you bring to this is really a revelation that this is not uh, the United States of America or any country for that matter really doesn't exist outside the people who live in it. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the question of myth making that kind of pervades, I suppose, all national projects, but particularly this project, which is made up of so many very different people. But the way you write, it makes it appear as you're reading like, well, hell, you know, this is what we should have been thinking all along. I mean, everybody gets made into a hero, but it's really just a bunch of different kind of people. Who who get drawn into this, this settler project, man, even before you go back four centuries? Right. Well, you know, it's, the whole book is kind of a footnote to this famous line by the 19th century historian, historian Ernest Renan, that nations are formed by that which they forget, not which they remember. You know, and, and the chief thing that we've forgotten is how many people have not wanted to be a part of this project, how, how many didn't want it to happen in the first place, and how many people, you know, were excluded from it at, at, its, at, its, you know, at its height in the 19th and 20th centuries. You know, and, and all the reasons why it shouldn't go on today, you know, um, there's, you know, you mentioned the Republic of New Africa. There's a that's one of my exciting discoveries. Again, like there's a rich history of black disunionism in the United States from the black abolitionists of the you know 1850s to um, Sutton Griggs. I don't know if you know his novel, oh, Imperium. Yeah. Imperium. Okay. You know, an incredible novel from 1899 about the formation of a separate black republic in an underground bunker in Texas. You know, nobody I'd never heard of that before, at least. Yeah. Um you know, and then up through the, the the 1960s. I mean, part of the book came out of my frustration, again, working at The Nation, which I still, you know, am associated with and, and love those people. But, you know, there's, as the magazine's title suggests, you know, there's a, a real kind of, I don't want to call it a fetish, but a real association and fondness for The Nation, um, which just doesn't necessarily seem to me like an obvious um, argument. You know, of course, we're we're um, still dependent on and proud of the successes of the civil rights movement, you know, Brown v. Board of Ed, the Civil Rights Act, you know, instances in which the federal government seems to be using its power to protect black people and other minorities, you know, from, from a worse possible oppression. But as we're seeing now, as those kinds of protections are rolled back, Roe v. Wade, I'm sure we'll get to this, you know, the federal government, again, as it did in earlier centuries, again, seems to be more of a threat to rights, you know, than, than a guarantor thereof. And I think that this is the kind of history that, as I say, we're going to kind of need 
to think through and be aware of in order to undermine those longstanding fundamental assumptions that associate progress with the nation, you know, that associate civil rights with a strong federal government. Um, and I think that people are starting now to um, to kind of question those assumptions. And I think that we're going to have to dig dig beneath this myth and remember the things that the formation of the nation required us to forget in order to move forward and figure out what the path is ahead. Mm. That's very powerful, man. And yeah, I'm, I'm sure we will. I'm thinking in particular about part three. I think it's chapter eight where you get into the whole conversation about states' rights from the northern perspective after right. you take us through the Fugitive Slave Act. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I know Richard going to have to talk about Roe because, I mean, it's almost like we get a preview of what is already beginning to emerge in the wake of, uh, of the of the Dobbs decision. So, um, in fact, let, let's 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 preview. And in a moment, we'll take a pause. But let's preview this. You 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 parcel this out into four parts. I mean, as you say, starting before there is a United States with that part one, a vast unwieldy nation. And then in part two, you cluster chapters around this question of irreconcilable differences, kind of leading us through the, the fear of coming apart that comes in the wake of creating the state. And then part three, uh, the earthquake comes. So, I mean, this is the part that some of us think we learned. Of course, I'm from Tennessee, so uh, it was the war between the states down there, you know, <laughs> northern aggression. <laughs> and then, of course, finally, the uh, the return of the repressed which is fascinating. You bring us right up to today. How did you conceive this kind of four part movement that in some ways, I think you characterize it very early on in the book as like, almost like a battle of metaphors, I think is the, right. the phrase you use. Well, we often think about the union is in terms of metaphors, the American experiment, it must go on, you know, the, the union as a marriage is kind of an obvious one that, that, that um, people kind of always return to. But I want to show them the way in which these metaphors kind of undermine the arguments. You know, an experiment can fail. A, a marriage can break up. Um, and there was always that possibility embedded in the very beginning. Um, so that, that's kind of what I wanted to show. They also reflect different ways that people at the time actually used of speaking about, about the union. You know, so the, the earthquake metaphor, the volcano metaphor, I start with, with Walt, Min Walt Whitman on page one, you know, the Civil War as, as, a, as, a, volcanic, as a volcanic upheaval um, of the nation, you know, similar to what I think we experienced in 2016 and perhaps even more in 2020. Um, so that was, that was just a, you know, useful way to organize the book. Um, and it, it reflects, you know, the way people talked about it at the time, the Enlightenment's association with science leads me to, to start with it, you know, the union as an experiment, um, kind of an alchemical reaction that they hoped would, would create something, something golden, I suppose. Um, just one, one thought I just had about, you mentioned the war of Northern aggression, like, and how in the 1850s, I'm talking about the approach to the Civil War as a fight over states' rights, but it's the states' rights of the North. I actually do see it as a war of Northern aggression, you know, and I see that as a good thing, um, is, is one of the, you know, one of the ways I'm trying to turn things on its head. It is indeed the case that the war was precipitated by the rising tide of abolitionism in the North, where I, where I differ from, like, you know, early lost cause historians, for instance, is that I see that as a good thing, indeed a very good thing, you know, and a model for us to follow today. Um, and without that, the union would have indeed gone on and survived and never broken up. So the entire project I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show is like the union breaking up is not necessarily something to rue. It's not something to lament because in that instance, it was absolutely necessary to end slavery. And today, perhaps it is also necessary to end the manifold injustices that we're finding a very hard time, you know, getting rid of and, and all the different things that we need to do as a society, you know, on climate change, on reproductive rights, on, on racial justice, uh, economic inequality, on everything. Like, it seems to me that our totally gridlocked and stalemated and really rigged political system is what's stopping us from making progress on those fronts. So the whole book came from a supposition that maybe as in the 1850s, it is necessary to break it apart in order to make progress on that front. So perhaps what we need is another not a war of northern aggression, but the northerners of today, you know, those who are interested in in equal rights and emancipation in the broadest sense, um, maybe do need to be a bit more aggressive. And even if it triggers a, a you know, backlash um, in order to make progress on those fronts. Um, just a little footnote on the, the war of northern aggression, you know, idea. Um, I, I completely accept that. And I think it's a good thing.
No, no not. question. I mean, anybody digging through the archives of the nation and in Comrades Inn, of course, you write about William Lord Garrison and the abolitionists. But I forget. It was a Garrison that said, you know, if they want to leave, let them leave and put not a straw in their way. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, I was reading that and started laughing. So at any rate, well, we're going to come back in a moment with, with you, Richard, here on the Black Table, and we're going to get into the, the, the chapters of this book and we'll go piece by piece through and as you lay out your analysis and your argument. So we'll be back in a moment here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. They put 10 in here? 10, and you don't come out till you die. And you eat him, eat him. Oh my God. in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Back at the Black Table with Greg Carr here at the Black Star Network, and we're joined today by Richard Kreitner, author of Break It Up, Secession, Division, and the Secret History of America's Imperfect Union. Richard, when we left, you had given us the grand tour and broad overview. And so why don't we get into um, how this project begins to come together in the first place, this vast, uh, unwieldy machine, so to speak. You use the metaphor of machines. And, and, and I think a lot of us, particularly since we have a kind of Anglo-centric view of uh, U.S. history, tend to forget that the Europeans that came here were not all English. In fact, I think you start the book with the with, with, with the, the, the pilgrims, and I think they're the first people to get remade. I mean, you, you talk about them being separatists, and we think about the French, of course, and, and the Spanish in Virginia and South Carolina. Talk a little bit about, if you don't mind, you know, how this enterprise begins. I mean, who, who's coming from where, and, and they all aren't here to seek a more perfect union. Maybe, maybe none of them are. Sure, but you know, I'm trying to write a subversive book about American history, so it seems counterproductive to begin with the Pilgrims, the most boring, <laughs> now, you know, starting point for any American history. But that was precisely my point, was to show that mm -hmm. even this very familiar origin point should be seen from a different angle. You know, so I start by saying that they didn't call themselves Pilgrims um, at the time. No, no, they never used the word. They called themselves separatists because they were trying to separate from the Church of England, trying to secede. That's what made them you know, outlaws, basically, and why they fled first to the Netherlands and then to America. Um, and then once they land here, there's this, this separatism kind of in their, you know, I hate the metaphor, but in, in their DNA, effectively, so that their settlements immediately start fracturing. That's what it is to be a 17th century New Englander, is to be constantly leaving one settlement because you're dissatisfied and moving on to another. You know, that's how, <laughs> that's how New England is settled. Each town is basically formed in the act of secession from another one in each colony. Um, so these, you know, secession is kind of ingrained in, in the idea of America in the first place. If you're ever dissatisfied with the existing political, social, religious arrangements and institutions, your first move is going to be to leave and start something new. And I or think did you just, did you just turn manifest destiny on his head. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It just looks like one big way. But you're saying people are literally trying to get away from other people. Absolutely. Until so they can't anymore. And that's that that's 
Cause that's the 20th century, you know? And then you put up a wall and uh, then there's the end of the project. No, yeah, well, there's a great book. I mean, I don't know if you, if you know Greg Grand's in The End of the Myth. Um, yes. It's kind of similar to mine in that he's re-looking at four centuries of American history through a totally different lens. It's an amazing book. Mm-hmm. Um, in any case, you know, basically what I'm doing in that first part is I'm explaining why did it take so long to form a union? You know, it took a century and a half, which is the same time between now and the Civil War, a very long time. And it wasn't because nobody thought of the idea, though for a while nobody did think of the idea. Um, but then once they did, nobody wanted anything to do with each other. You know, the colonies were, as you're saying, uh, founded by different people, you know, Huguenots and English, Scotsmen, Germans, um, Czech people, you know, the people from all over Europe. As I say in the book, not a continent generally known for, you know, peaceful cohabitation. Um, and there's there's various plans that come up, starting with William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania in the 1690s, to form a colonial union because, I mean, mostly it'll be easier to arrange defense against Indians, you know, against Indian attacks and, and very, you know, the French, the Dutch, any kind of external enemies that there are to the English colonies. So he proposes this idea and the London officials like it because it's going to make it easier to organize trade, defense, uh, border disputes. Um, but the colonists rejected out of hand. They want nothing to do with one another. As Again, they, they came over here not to join a union, but to be separated. Mm-hmm. And that continues for the next century and a half. You know, Benjamin Franklin famously in 1754 puts out the first political cartoon in the United, in, in America, you know, join or die with the disjointed snake. And that's kind of remembered. I think it's mostly taught in, in history classes and in history books as kind of a forerunner of the union that eventually was formed. But it was basically propaganda for his plan of union that he suggested, you know, intricately um, designed, inspired by the Iroquois, um, as I describe in the book. Um, and then again, it's completely. I think we probably, and I'm glad you spent some time on that. Could you mention for folks who may not be familiar, what was that kind of uh, Terry that Benjamin Franklin undertakes with the Iro- Iroquois F- uh, Federation? Sure. Yeah. I mean, he's a, he's he's in Philadelphia. He's a rising printer. He gets a contract with the Pennsylvania Assembly to print public records. And one of the records that he prints is a, a treaty or a, really a transcript of a conference that took place in Lancaster between um, officials of Pennsylvania, Maryland and um, uh, Virginia uh, with the Iroquois to, to kind of. Uh, I think there was a murder on the frontier or something. They're going to try to mend this. But mostly the colonists are trying to get the Indians drunk and buy a bunch of land, buy a bunch of land. Um, but in the process of that, the, these tensions um, crop up between the Marylanders and the Virginians about who's going to get to speak first. And the Iroquois are just incredibly wonderful orators. They're excellent diplomatists. You know, they've, they've figured all of this out. A long time ago, they formed their own League of the Five Nations in about the 15th century, it seems, um, which is basically a rudimentary union. It's a form of political union that is widely admired by the by not only the English colonists, but by the French as well. Everybody sees that this is a very sophisticated form of political organization. Uh, It's a federation. And so, frankly, uh, uh, one of the Iroquois orators at this conference gives a speech, Kana Satego, in which he says, we learned long ago to unite and to set aside our differences. It's time for you guys to do the same. It'll be good for everybody, especially yourselves. Um, form a union, he says. And so Benjamin Franklin, you know, we don't really have like, there's no smoking gun proof, but Franklin did print this transcript. He printed it in vastly higher quantities than he usually did with um, Indian treaties. Um, and I think, and, and he basically immediately turns his attention to learning more about the Iroquois and getting involved in Iroquois diplomacy and forming a plan of union for the English colonists. So I think there's pretty good circumstantial proof that Franklin is inspired by the example of the Iroquois, by Conestotego's speech, um, to draw up his first plan of union. Wow. I, you know, my footnotes to the story in the book are extensive because the argument has been overstated many times by, by you know, scholars less responsible with the facts. Um, yes. But I think there is a pretty good circumstantial argument to be made that he was inspired by the Iroquois model. I mean, he says so explicitly in a letter in 1751 where he says, if it's possible for so many savages, the word he uses, right. you know, to, to form a union, why, why can't we do the same? Why he says so explicitly. Yeah, man, that um, makes sense. That makes sense. Well, let me, let me, let me, um, we're, we're going to, we're coming up on a break. We want to take a couple more minutes, but I want to ask you just in terms of this moment you have us at, was it more about a common enemy than it was about having things in common that kind Absolutely. of. Absolutely. 
I mean, I say right at the beginning, fear is the most important ingredient of any attempt to form an American Union. Wow. The, the first union is the New England Confederation of 1643, which is, you know, fear of, of Indian raids, as I say. And the same is true in the 1750s that folds into the Seven Years' War and indeed the American Revolution. You know, it's fear of, of I mean, as, as we've learned in all the debates over 1619, I mean, definitely many of the American revolutionaries were inspired by fear of slave revolts to join, you know, to join the fight. Not every single one, but that was an important ingredient, as was fear of Indian attacks, you know, right. um, and fear of, of a common enemy is really the glue. And without that, you don't really have it. So that's like, that's a story I tracked through the years. I mean, look at like 1948, you know, in the beginning of the Cold War, I show that like the idea of national security, the National Security yeah, Act of 1948, is basically an attempt to to use fear as a new form of keeping the union together and and keeping people quiet. You know that's that's straight across the board every century. Um, you know, I think we froze there for a minute, Richard. But I think I, I think what we lost there, you it brought us into the forties and the fifties and the Cold War. Where you were you uh, did you evoke the C word? Was it communism? Was it the threat of yeah the Soviet uh, Union? Yeah, yeah. You know, fear, of, fear of the outsider is used to yeah. suppress dissent and to keep the country together. You know in every century of American settlement thus far. Okay, very good. That's, all, that's what I thought. I'm sorry. And now I realize the producers are telling us we didn't have a freeze. It was me. So very good. So everybody heard it and we'll hear it then when, when it's broadcast. We're going to come back in a moment uh, with you, Richard. And when we do, um, I hope you'll kind of lead us through some of the major figures in U.S. history that you have kind of pulled the curtain back on everybody from James Madison and Thomas Jefferson to John Adams and even George Washington, whose presidency you describe as failed. This is fascinating to me. So we'll be back in a moment with Richard Kreitner, author of Break It Up here at the Black Table. We'll see you back in a second. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing, creating, making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm Greg Carr, your regular host, and we're joined today by Richard Kreitner, author of Break It Up, Secession Division and the Secret History of America's Imperfect Union. Richard, you raised some very interesting things here in part uh, one, is, and then we'll get to part two fairly quickly. You're reimagining the founders. I mean, everybody from Aaron Burr, who you said is not going to throw away his shot <laughs> to secede and go away. James Madison, uh, who doesn't seem particularly satisfied with that bicameral legislature they set up. Uh, uh, even even Thomas Jefferson, who himself makes some saber rattling around possible secession. In fact, you talk about Madison having to have a conversation with him. And then George Washington, you say he has a failed presidency. I'm wondering, after there is a United States of America established, you know, they've got to come up with Articles of Confederation. We learned it in school that they were weak, so they created a better document. In fact, almost like demigods created the greatest document in the history of the world. Walk us through some of the, <laughs> some of this moment of founding, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's there's so much to cover. I mean, the Articles of Confederation, one of the most amazing things I found is that it was only ratified, weak as they were, they, they were too strong for many people, and they were only ratified when the French, who were basically the Americans' military supplier in the revolution, blackmailed Maryland into say into ratifying the Articles of Confederation, which Maryland was otherwise not going to do, and said, we're not going to give you military assistance. You're facing invasion from the British. We're not going to help you unless you ratify the Articles of Confederation. And that is the way it happened. You know, nobody's thought that. Uh, the first American constitution was only ratified. It wouldn't have been otherwise um, after being blackmailed by a foreign power. So that's the Articles of Confederation. And, you know, of course, we're all, we're all taught it was weak. Who was it weak for? It was weak for the rich. You know, it wasn't strong enough to get them their money, <laughs> you know. You know that's, um, that's a common theme in the text. You talk about these sequential kind of capitulations to the rich being another theme that it threads through the history. That's fascinating. The Constitution, in my mind, and in the mind of many, you know, previous historians, progressive historians, mm -hmm. is that the Constitution is basically a counter-revolutionary coup 
by the rich and powerful. You know, uh, um, Carl Becker is the first you know, historian who kind of came up with this. You know, the, the revolution began as a fight over home rule, and then it turned into who was going to rule at home. And the rich won that fight. You know, um, they feared that there was going to be a second revolution or a civil war. Um, Shays Rebellion, you know, populist rebellions in favor of a more equal distribution of power um, in 1786, which, which is, you know, possibly a, a future project for me, just a, a study of that year. Um, you know, they, they feared a second revolution was going to happen and instituted, you know, it'd be today as if the richest people in America, the Koch brothers, the Mercers, all these people got into a room and just threw out the Constitution and wrote a new one. And yes, put it before the people once, you know, only once wow. as a group of people, a very small one at that. Mm. Um, all white men, obviously, you know, largely propertied, voted on our Constitution um, and, we, and we profess to be a democracy. Um, you know, put it before the people in, in a vote, but but said that only nine out of 13 states needed to ratify it, not the 13 out of 13 that the Artis Articles of Confederation required. I mean, that that's a coup d'etat. If, if it happened today, that's what we would call it. Yeah. Um, and then even after that, I'm trying to show, you mentioned Washington's failed presidency. You know, when we think about Biden today, he came in promising unity. You know, he was going to heal the divisions. He knows McConnell. He's going to, you know, he's going to get Republicans to see the light. We see that hasn't happened. I would call that a failed presidency. Washington was somewhat similar. You know, he, he came in trying to put the United into the United States of America, which didn't really make a lot of sense to people at the time because it clearly was not united. And then the country's more divided than ever before when he leaves office. Um, he wanted to retire after one term in 1792, and all of his advisors say, you can't do that. The country's going to fall apart. Wow. Um, and when he finally does retire, you know, people think it is going to, and, and it nearly does. You know, you mentioned Thomas Jefferson, the Alien and Sedition Acts, you know, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. We're kind of taught these things, but do we really think like that Thomas Jefferson, this like godly figure, obviously he's come down a couple pegs in recent years, but, you know, still like we would associate him, I think, with the maintenance of the American Union, sure. you know, favored secession, um, you know, rather than submit to what he saw as an unjust federal law. And all these guys I'm trying to show, they all have their doubts about the Union. They all had moments where they thought maybe it shouldn't survive. Even Madison did, you know, during the war, the dark days of the, of the late revolution. They all did. So, you know, I, I think that's kind of one, one of my purposes there is to give ourselves permission today to mm -hmm. also, you know, think seriously about the union. We kind of take this inheritance, you know, for granted and, and, and assume that we necessarily need to keep it together. But the Declaration of Independence gives us, you know, the rubric for deciding whether the government is serving our purposes today. Yeah. And I think that's like, that's all there is. You know, that's all we've got. That's the best thing we've got. Absolutely. Is the government serving, you know, the rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? Jefferson says, if not, here's what you do. <laughs> you know, you change it, you alter or abolish it. That's right. And it's fascinating because it is ultimately, I think, in that sense, and I'm glad you said it that way, and we'll, we'll get back to this near the end, a very hopeful book. I mean, you know, and, and I mean, to say that something is up for grabs like you do as you open in, I think it's chapter seven. And he said, well, into the 19th century, this this project is very much up for grabs. And that kind of you highlight California and Texas and, the, you know, Mormons and, and Utah and going west. You know, but if it's up for grabs, that means it can be made differently. You know, walk us through a little bit of that moment that we think we know about the Civil War and Reconstruction, which uh, you, as you say, uh, just enlarging this stream of folks who have come to realize that and that might have been the best shot in the 19th century for creating a concept of the United States was the was the Reconstruction era. But those capitulations that you lay out, you know, so we see another missed opportunity. Can you walk us through that 19th century, that mid 19th century, if you will, just for. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, as I say, my heart is with the abolitionists before the war who said, let's break it up. Let's secede from the Union so as not to preserve slavery. And as you mentioned, even William Lloyd Garrison, once the once the secession crisis begins, says, let them go. All the abolitionists say that let's not fight for a pro-slavery union. But then once the war turns against slavery, all those abolitionists are unionists, they're nationalists. That's why the nation is called the nation, you know? And that's what the Reconstruction era is all about. E even the I black ones we have to mention, because I, I think about Martin Delaney, who was actually in West Africa making a deal saying, we'll just leave and come to Africa. And then the war jumps off, he comes back to the United States and becomes the first black major in the Union Army. Right, because they, see, yeah. because they see for the first time that maybe this really can be something. Maybe mm -hmm. this can be what they said it was going to be and it never actually was. Mm -hmm. And that's a moment of immense hope. You know, I love that. I just love that moment. That's why I start with Whitman. You know, he's excited that the Union has broken up. 
you know, he's, he's, he's stoked. Like, and Nathaniel Hawthorne also has got totally different politics. They're like, let, now we can do something with this country. You know, it's very exciting. And I see Lincoln, you know, Lincoln's a fairly conservative individual compared to these guys, but that's, that's what I see his kind of insistence that the union has to be saved. You know, as I say, in the 1850s, my heart's with the, the disunionists really. But then Lincoln, I think is a genuine hero, you know, um, I, again, very old school kind of opinion, but like, he, he saw it was important to save the union because it was a wager about what the country might become, what that effort, what those deaths, what that suffering and whatnot could be used for, which was, yes, to abolish slavery, but then to create a genuinely multiracial democracy. You know, I, I think that there's all the evidence in the world that towards the end of the war, that's where Lincoln was going. And that's certainly where the, you know, the former abolitionists were going, the radical Republicans, Thaddeus Stevens, another major, you know, major figure for me, um, Douglas you know, where they were going. Um, and that's the moment where it might've happened, you know? Um, but then what, 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 what failed was the resolve of Northern whites. These people who, as I show in the 1850s, were against slavery, not because they opposed slavery or because they favored racial equality, but because they didn't like that the South was getting all the resources, you know, that they were getting all of the, um, that they were, they were getting all the spoils basically of federal power. Um, and the North felt like they weren't being represented enough. So these Northern whites went into the war with a very kind of milk toast, you know, very lackadaisical commitment to racial equality. And it's really not a big surprise that after the war in the 1860s and especially the 1870s, there's an economic recession. That's never a good thing for progressive politics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they, they decide we care more about money than we do about racial equality. And they kind of give up the fight. They take their boots off the Southern throat, you know, Southern white throat. And um, and that's kind of the moment, the, the great big reversal, the backwards revolution, as I call it. Yes. Um, yes. So that's kind of where, where I see it. And like, that's, you don't want to say like nothing's changed in 150 years, but um, not much has changed. You know, that, that kind of return to the compromise tradition of the founding lasts until the 1950s. When the civil rights movement again you know war of northern aggression i mean it's not northern aggression but kind of northern minded um you know questions it and then breaks up the political system in a way that we're still picking up the pieces of absolutely absolutely you know? I know we're, we're coming up on a break but i hope we can squeeze in maybe you can help us a lot of people on all sides of the political spectrum like to draw comparisons between the Roe versus Wade and Dred Scott. But you really tease out the fact that maybe, like say, anger with the federal overreach and the South's getting resources. You, you talk about states' rights in a way that I think previews what we're going to see now with, with California and other places. You know, they say, OK, yeah, you got a fugitive slave law that says anywhere an African person is, they can be returned to slavery. So these northern states then began to, you know, strengthen personal liberties and, and, and per, you know, and strength. I mean, is that a preview in some ways of what we might anticipate happening as these the Supreme Court begins to attack some of these things we've taken for granted as rights? I hope so. You know, you mentioned it's a hopeful book. I think that's a pretty interesting reading. I mean, I'm I'm not a hopeful individual. But I'm really <laughs> well, neither am I. But I'm saying, but you, as you said, what else do we have? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The option is available to us. That's you know, I just hope that that people on the left, kind of broadly construed, I suppose, are prepared to question these fundamental assumptions, you know, about about nationalism, really, about patriotism, maybe, mm. um, you know, and, and prepared to go in that kind of direction of questioning the federal government so deeply ingrained in us to see, you know, the Department of Justice or something as like the protector of rights when, when I think that's less and less so, you know, less and less obvious that that's the case. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, of course, 1870, Grant, you talk, talking about that, right? Going after the Klan, we, we kind of forget those roots. Mary Garland liked to say that in his, uh, he said in his opening speech when he was appointed, but I don't know, it seems like he I've seen too much about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll come back in a moment here at the Black Table and we'll kind of bring this momentum into an analysis of where we are today with our guest, Richard Kreitner, and a book that we recommend that you get as soon as you can, break it up. Secession, Division, and the Secret History of America's Imperfect Union. Back in a moment here at the Black Table. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. 
Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Again, support the Black Star Network. You're not going to have conversations like this in the way that we're having them anywhere else. So make sure you support the Black Star Network. We're back with Richard Kreitner, author of Break It Up. Uh, Richard, in parts three and four, uh, you you take us through, and you kind of already done this in some ways, you take us through the 19th century and the things we're grappling with here now in in the 20th century. You talk about this grammatical shift that happens after the Civil War, but it's the grammatical shift. It isn't a, a deep substantive shift in terms of uh, how we think about the United States as a nation. And one of the things that one of the many things you write about in part four that I think I found particularly fascinating is all of the folks who live in this country who have this desire to get away from the country in various ways. I mean, when you talk about the Republic of New Africa, you talk about the Puerto Rican independence movement, uh, you talk about a number of different movements that have in their roots things that probably go back as far as the country. I mean, during the Revolutionary War, we know that as many black folk fought for the British probably as did for the Americans and more than that ran away. I mean, so when people think about black folks being patriotic, I always laugh. I'm like, did y'all read the documents? Black people, (laughs) we're we're fighting for the thing everybody else is fighting for, which is some room to operate. Could you walk us through what we generally receive in school and in popular culture as the civil rights movement and the wake of the civil rights movement as America is becoming more and more kind of a, a... uh, e pluribus unum. In fact, you invert <laughs> that phrase. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, where we, how we got into today in terms of this, this conversation? Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, the, the grammatical shift you're talking about from the United States are to the United States is, is, is purported to be this kind of, you know, unification that happened after the Civil War. And I show that grammatically, at least it was part of a larger shift. It had nothing really to do with people's changing conceptions of the union. To the extent, though, that it is true that the union was more solid. I mean, there weren't as many secessionist movements after the Civil War as there were previously. That is, again, because of this reversion to the compromise tradition. There were no major challenges to the to the union as conceived, which is effectively to serve white supremacy. You know, the so so who's excluded from this this country? You know, I've heard one critique of the book that like, well, for all of those movements, it only broke up the once. It's it's been a fairly stable. Country, but on what basis? You know, on the basis of racial exclusion and segregation. You know, um, before the war and after the war. Um, so that's like that kind of explains away the 20th century to me. You know, the first half of it basically is, of course, there's not going to be any kind of major movements because everybody was pretty much, you know, all the the whites at least were pretty much agreed about what this country was supposed to be about. And then once that's once that stops is is when you get you know all the political turmoil, as I say. The challenge for the 20th century, if you're writing a book that argues that secession has always existed in American history, is to show the places where it did crop up, you know, after the Civil War, which is, you know, interesting and significant to me, but not nearly as um, prominent as Southern, you know, secessionism before the war or Northern, you know, abolitionist disunionism before the war either. Um, But there's all these very interesting movements, you know, as you mentioned, Puerto Rican independence movement, Chicano separatists, both in the 1910s, uh, aligned with the Mexican Revolution, where there was a plan to take back the Southwest from the United States. That's what the Zimmerman telegram is all about, you know, that the Germans during World War I send to Mexico to say, if you join the war against the United States and we win, we'll give you back the Southwest that America took during the Mexican War. In fact, you know, in fact mention, before you go on, let me, let me just mention and give a, a nod to the Museum of African-American History and Culture here in D.C., because 
So many people were not aware of that until they put a panel in there on World War One that showed that overture. And people, I was watching people stunned by that. So they actually made an overture and say, look, we'll give you these states back if you join us. Right. And then and then the plan to San Diego, which is this Mexican revolutionaries plan, is not only to form, you know, a, a state for Mexicans in the in the southwest, but also a state for black people, a separate black nation in the south. You know, there's going to be this alliance to kind of claw back land from the settler colonial United States. You know, it's very interesting. And the Zimmerman telegram, the interception of it is actually what gets the United States into World War One and, you know, ends the era of American isolation. So, it, you know, that shows to me that there's still fear. Yes. There's, again, still fear of American politics as kind of a very major element of what's holding things together and what motivates the federal government to act is fear of disunion. There's still this, this kind of paranoia that, that what was cobbled together so haphazardly and held together so difficultly could still fall apart. And that's, that, to me, explains the 1960s as well. There's all these movements from you know, the Republic of New Africa that you mentioned to a Chicano separatist movement. There's lesbian separatist movements. There's hippies imagining forming their own underground states of America. You know, everybody who's anybody is, is, is imagining getting away from this kind of horrible behemoth you know, and starting their own thing. So, so let me ask you, I mean, we, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I want to, I want to ask you, uh, you probably saw uh, recently in New York Times Magazine, Charles Homan's article on uh, the whole Stop the Steal movement and the American mm -hmm. right. One of the elements that seems to want to keep the thing together, albeit on its own terms, is this extreme right kind of white nationalist movement, the Tea Party and everything that's going you know, how ironic is that? I mean, they're not talking about seceding. They say, no, we want to strengthen the union, but on our terms. How do you read that? And how does that, that sounds very similar to the South in the 1850s. As I say, if the North was in favor of, of states' rights in the 1850s, the South was actually in favor of a more perfect union on their terms for their purposes. And that's what we see today. I mean, another kind of sub-argument of the book is that nationalism can shade into separatism quite easily if you feel like the nation has been captured by elements that are hostile to your own interests, identity, ideas. You know, that that's why the, the, the idea of the Confederate flag in the January 6th, you know, kind of insurrection or whatever was was not that surprising to me. People are like, how can you be for make America great? and be in favor of insurrection and be in favor of confederate how's that nationalism and if you really look at american history it's all one thing you know it just takes different guises in different moments depending on where they feel that their interests are and i just i kind of think that the left should do the same thing you know we should be in favor of nationalism when it serves our purposes and we should walk that back when it seems not to as right now in an era of right-wing judicial supremacy and whatnot um I, I think it's not serving our, our interests. Yes. Well, I mean, you walked us perfectly into where we kind of want it to end up today, having, having covered so much territory in these few minutes. Uh, what do you think should be the ends of, as you write, our, our, our continent spanning federation? <laughs> what are the means? I mean, as we sit here uh, in the entering the third quarter of 2022 with everything that's laid out before us, you know, what are some of the possibilities you imagine in this, Rich? I mean, as we're sitting here, I mean. I mean, the one that I would favor is people starting to talk a little more maturely about secession and disunion. You know, each side, when they lose an election, starts to think about these things. You know, California started thinking about it after Trump. There was talk of Calexit. Then after Biden won, it was Texas. And they're still talking about it, obviously, because they're not in power right now. That's right. You know, and, and each side is is very hypocritical in this regard. And I even show there's a great history to that. You know, in the early in the early 19th century, you know, both sides, the Federalists and the Republicans, were doing the exact same thing. It was a game of roundabout, as one politician said at the time. And I just think that we should kind of we should be a little more open and less um kind of finger wagging when everybody considers, well, is this union really worthwhile? You know, we act as if that's an impermissible question, whereas I think it's actually the most American question of all. You know, that is the question of the American Revolution. That is the question of the Civil War, is rationally thinking, what are the ends being served here? Are they ours? What are we willing to give up in order to see that it continues? It seems to me, and a lot of polls, you know, bear this out, that um, interest in secession in, in the possibility that the union doesn't work anymore is kind of the only thing we actually do have in common, you know, which kind of goes back to the colonial period as well, when people were saying, you know what, the union, no, no thanks, I'm not interested. Yes. You know, the one thing we have in common is that we want nothing to do with one another. Well, now, what does that look like? What does that entail? Probably mass movements of people, um, oh. but that's better than national tyranny 
it seems to me. <laughs> sure, sure. And of course, the fact that as we uh, work our way through uh, a global heat wave, and I love the way that you remix Lincoln's last uh, best hope on earth, the last great hope on earth. You know, what? Are, what is at stake? It's beyond just this territory we call United States. Huh? We're facing a, a thing that now we're at an existential crisis. Yeah. You, you, well, talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind. I know we only have a couple of minutes, but, you know, you write about that, though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly if the United States could be moved to act on climate change, it would be an um, important building block for global action, obviously. But we're, we're not acting on climate change right now. Perhaps the Northeast, freed from federal constraints, the Supreme Court especially, could. The West Coast, you know. Perhaps if we were smaller countries, at least some of them could do something about climate change, if not to alleviate, you know, to prevent it from getting worse than to deal with the consequences. Right now, we're, we're not doing anything. We're an ungovernable nation. And um, I, 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 I'm not sure, but I do wonder, as you say, the Lincoln quote, I do wonder if disunion rather than keeping the union together is, as Lincoln said, the last best hope of Earth. Man. You Because know, right now we're, we're holding the whole world back from doing anything. That's very true. That's very true. I'm, I, I'm not going to put that all on Joe Manchin after all, but uh, I mean, it's not. I, I put a little on Joe Manchin, but I put, I put it on a horribly designed system That's for exactly right. representative governments. That's you know? exactly right. Hey, man, I love the way you had J James Madison losing his mind around this thing. Like, well, what are y'all doing? <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, uh, he said he said it's going to it's going to break up the union someday. Yeah. You know? Isn't that something? I mean, isn't that something? We don't think about that. Uh, Lin Manuel, you, you, sh you should have checked with Richard Kreitner before you <laughs> went to the uh, to, to the book for your for your play, brother. But anyway, but uh, you know, Richard, as as we close for now, and we hope you'll come back and join us. Particularly, you're working on a new project uh, that we saw: American <laughs> Jew slavery in the Civil War. What is that about? Man? Yeah, I thought, I thought reviving uh, secession was not not controversial enough. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a study of six American Jews. Um, and how they dealt with the politics of slavery in the Civil War. Um, some of them are religious, some are atheists, some are um, slave owners, some are abolitionists, um, who are you know, the ones I'm kind of most interested in. But I'm looking at the story of, of how a people defined by a historical experience of slavery encountered a country also defined by a historical experience of slavery, and what obligations that they thought that tradition imposed on them, um, in what ways they you know used um, participation in this debate over slavery in the Civil War to assimilate into the country, to become white, you know, as, as the literature puts it. Um, this comes out of a paper I wrote as an undergraduate, you know, 12 years ago about Jewish abolitionists. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really excited about it. Uh, there's some interesting characters. Um, I'm interested in seeing how different characters, you know, one pro-slavery and one anti-slavery responded to the same events in the 1850s, you know, Bleeding Kansas, for instance. Um, and I, you know, I used Break It Up to uh, kind of think about my American identity for about five years. And I'm using this one to think about my Jewish Jewish American identity. Um, hopefully it won't take five years, but sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm uh, it'll be called uh, No More Pharaohs, No More Slaves. Oh, wow. That is fascinating. Listen, man, as you're thinking through it, you're helping us think through it. And, and, and it's quite a service. So uh, your your personal website is still up, right? RichardKreitner.com? Yep. So we can follow you there and look at some of the things you're doing and, and anticipate what's to come. Uh, we want to thank you, man, for spending this hour with us, Richard thank Kreitner. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Oh, no. Thank you. A historian, journalist, contributing editor to the nation, writer, thinker. And as we can see, someone who is not only using history to imagine, but to reimagine uh, not only the United States of America, but what our obligation is to each other in the world. So thank you again, Richard. And we, we look forward to having you back soon. Yeah, thank you very much, Greg. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll be back in a moment to clear the table and prepare for next week here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. A real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be black owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart.
bring your eyeballs home. You dig? When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing, creating, making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Welcome back to The Black Table. We've enjoyed uh, the past hour with Richard Kreitner, author of Break It Up, which I hope and we all hope gives you a new foundation, certainly a, a spark to rethink this thing we call United States of America and our responsibilities to each other in the world. And in that vein, we evoke a, a previous generation's writer, thinker, scholar, who was friends with, among others, Oswald Garrison Villard, one of the founders of the MCP, the grandson of uh, William Lloyd Garrison. And we're thinking none other uh, than none other of W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote his doctoral dissertation at Harvard University on the suppression of the African slave trade to the United States of America. And in fact, that became his first published book, the first book in the Harvard Historical Studies series. And he ends that book. In fact, the last paragraph of the book goes as follows. It behooves the United States, therefore, in the interest of both scientific truth and future social reform, to carefully study such chapters of her history as that of the suppression of the slave trade. The most obvious question which this study suggests is, how far in a state can a recognized moral wrong safely be compromised? And although this chapter of history can give us no definite answer suited to the ever varying aspects of political life, yet it would seem to warn any nation from following, from allowing, through careless and moral cowardice, any social evil to grow. No persons would have seen the Civil War with more, sur more surprise and horror than the revolutionists of 1776. Yet, from this small and apparently dying institution of their day arose the walled and castled slave power. Du Bois ends the book by saying, from this we may conclude that it behooves nations as well as men, and I would add women, people, to do things at the very moment when they ought to be done. That's W.B. Du Bois from 1896 and from 2020's book, Break It Up. Richard Kreitner gives us a very similar message. We have to do better. This species doesn't have to be here. Join us next week here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. And please support the Black Star Network as we continue in this work to help build a better future, a better society for us all. See you next week.